we are going to move on to our next presenter, keynote speaker, sorry, uh, keynote speaker from uh, Professor Franz Wins, uh, Weizen, sorry, uh, Professor Weizen. Um, before we going to the uh, to the keynote speaker, I would like to uh, read his bio uh, from Professor Fran Weizen. Uh, from Pre Professor Fran Weizen is a professor of empirical and practical religious studies at Red Bull University, the Netherlands, and honorary professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Dar Salaam, Tanzania. He lectures on policy and management issues concerning religious diversity in secular and multicultural societies. Uh, his current research focuses on religion and ecology, more particularly on how various faith-based organization collaboration in environmental campaign. Uh, long list of his uh, publications and works, I cannot read it one by one. He is an outstanding uh, person. Then we will hear some uh, material delivered by him. Uh, Professor from Wisens, the time and the floor is yours. You, you are still uh, mute, sir. Professor, you are still muted. You need to unmute your microphone. Sorry, now I hope that you can see my uh, okay. screen, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very grateful that I'm here in this uh, uh, conference. And of course, I had hoped that we could have done this uh, conference uh, offline in Bandung, but unfortunately, due to Corona, it is impossible. Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, I'm uh, also thankful to have this opportunity to share uh, with you some of my uh, research. Um, well, I, I was asked to uh, speak about uh, contemporary issues in the study of religion. And well, I decided to um, choose one topic that, that I'm uh, involved in uh, presently, and that is the relationship between uh, belief and uh, environment. Um, so the, the topic will be environment, environmental challenges in Indonesia, an emerging issue in the social study of uh, religion. And well, my, my talk is a little bit related to the talk of uh, Professor Lim, uh, because I also uh, try to show uh, the importance of interdisciplinary uh, research and, well, I, I hope that I can uh, uh, show you how we do that uh, in practice. And, well, I, I thank uh, Dr. Iqbal for the invitation to be here this morning and to share with you some of my uh, work. Um, well, so one of the, the emerging issues in the social study of religion, as far as I can see, is the relationship between belief and environment. And uh, I, I purposely use the term belief and not uh, religion agama. Uh, later on, it will be clear why I do that. This is a huge topic, a very complex uh, topic with various uh, dimensions. There are conceptual dimensions, there are empirical dimensions, there are uh, theoretical dimensions, and many questions come up. For example, uh, what do religious leaders teach about the relationship between humans and nature, huh? based on the scriptures, based on the, their teachings? How do believers conceptualize and interpret the ecological challenges, and what solutions do they come up with? What forms of faith-based uh, environmentalism uh, take place and how do 
faith-based organization position themselves in relation to the government, for example, but also in relation to other non-governmental actors. Um, Indonesia is the third largest polluter in the world. It is not about this, uh, I mean, figure, it, it may be the second, and it may be the fourth. It's just to give you an, 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 uh, the impression that, that uh, Indonesia is uh, 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 the, the, a large contributor to uh, the um, uh, pollution in the world. And there are quite some studies on uh, the relationship between environmentalism and uh, faith. Now, in this paper, I do not address all the questions. I do not uh, address the theoretical issues. I don't address the conceptual uh, issues. I rather uh, explore uh, some of the ongoing projects, uh, completed projects and, and ongoing projects that I am involved in. And I try to answer the question, what the social study of religion can contribute to the environmentalism theory and practice. So that is my, re my, my question. Uh, what can a social study of religion uh, contribute to the environmentalism theory and practice? And uh, I was explicitly asked uh, to talk about the social study of religion. So I'm not talking about the theological uh, understanding or I'm not talking uh, from a faith uh, perspective. Well, as I said uh, already, um, environmental degradation is a common concern to the whole of humanity. And I share with uh, uh, Professor Lin, uh, Lim her, her latest uh, comments in the discussion about hope. Well, if you look at the environmental challenges in the world, uh, you are, we are not very hopeful. Uh, but on the other hand, I do see uh, quite some um, many young people who are involved in environmentalism, and that makes me really uh, very hopeful. Um, so en environmental degradation is a common challenge to the whole of humanity, and Indonesia is a major player. Indonesia is a major player in it, both in terms of the causes and the solutions to this problem. Um, first, a little bit about the causes. Uh, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world, population-wise. It has the second largest rainforest in the world. It is named the third largest polluter, the second biggest contributor to waste, and the second highest emitter of greenhouse, greenhouse gas, and the biggest deforester in the world. Well, this is not, uh, these are not facts to, to be very hopeful, but I hope to show that uh, there is uh, some reason for hope. Indonesia has a population growth of 1.5% and an economic growth of 6%. Well, I, when I wrote that, that, that was still the case. Uh, now, you, due to Corona, uh, we are in a regression, uh, but uh, the, the growth rate in Indonesia is quite high. Jakarta alone, uh, produces 6,000 tons of garbage every day. 6,000 tons of garbage every day. And rivers such as uh, Chiliwung, Jakarta, and Chitarum in uh, Bandung, I'm going to talk about it later, are heavily polluted with microplastics, chemicals, methyls, antibiotics, uh, creating huge uh, health problems. Indonesia lost already 80% of its forest. Now, forests, uh, affect climate change with their carbon absorbing superpowers. And uh, well, this is highly uh, uh, efficient and free of charge. So cutting trees is not very wise. And as I said already, uh, Indonesia lost already 80% of its rainforest and this continues. <coughs> well, this is not enough about uh, Indonesia uh, as a major player in causing climate change. Uh, happily, Indonesia is also one of the major players internationally uh, in climate change negotiations. Uh, it was the first OPEC country to sign the Kyoto Protocol in 2004, uh, which is a very hopeful sign. It hosted the United Nations uh, Climate Conference in Bali in 2007, which produced the Bali Roadmap, which is still used in our uh, debates uh, today. It promised to control uh, green gas, greenhouse gas emission at the meeting uh, of the G20 leaders in 2009. And recently, uh, the government um, 
decided to reduce the plastic waste um, by 70% in 2025. That is still three years to go or four years to go. 70% uh, uh, reduction of plastic waste. Now, in its uh, domestic policy, the Indonesian government uh, promotes uh, green policies uh, despite various uh, constraints. For example, in 2014, uh, the Indonesian Ministry of Environment published a report on environment education in Indonesia to implement environmental education in the 250,000 250, schools and 3,000 universities among Islamic universities, UENs, EIENs, and so on. So maybe, maybe later on we can come back to the, uh, the discussion. I see many UENs now advertising themselves as green campuses uh, using applied uh, technology, uh, recycling water or, or generating their own uh, electricity. But very often that is separated from their religious uh, understanding as uh, Islamic scholars. Um, and increasingly, also the government uh, uh, includes faith-based organizations. For me, coming from a quite secular society, uh, where, where uh, the overwhelming majority has no religious background, or at least no affiliated to a religious institute, that is interesting that the, the, the government, the Indonesian government, uh, includes faith-based organizations to meet its targets. For example, uh, it stimulates uh, Eco Pesantren, uh, a program in 2008, uh, Eco Pesantren, uh, and uh, it has another program on Eco Mosques. Uh, so it, um, it stimulates uh, Eco Mosques uh, uh, to be more uh, eco friendly. Um, well, uh, in the Routledge Handbook of Religion and Ecology, uh, my colleague uh, Zain, uh, Zainal Bagir at, at UGM and uh, Jim Martian wrote a very interesting uh, article, a chapter, uh, on environmentalism from an Islamic point of view. And I quote, I quote from that uh, chapter, um, the issue of ecology does not occupy an important role yet in Islamic thought. And the reason is that there is a tension between norms and practices in Islam. They argue that one of the important keys to further Islam and ecology is to pay more attention to the empirical study of living traditions and practices. Such studies have long existed, but are not widely accepted because of a narrow normative criteria about what makes an ID or a practice Islamic. What needs to be explored is not only the consistency and the coherence of an ID with the, the canonical sources, but how Muslim communities develop, justify, and defend eco-friendly practices and form their ideas about Islam and ecology through their uh, practices. And so, uh, end of quote. And I, I stress here, uh, they, they argue to pay more attention to the empirical study of living traditions. Uh, uh, in harmony with the, with the topic of this conference, I, I could say that the social study of um, the um, living traditions and to look at it from the consistency of norms and practice uh, in Islam. And I noted, I, I gave many talks uh, about this on, at uh, UENs, that um, yeah, there, there's quite some talk about applied technology, as I said already, green campus, but uh, thinking about it and relating it to Islamic thought or Islamic theology, uh, that is, uh, um, well, not so easy. So what I will uh, do um, is um, I try to reflect on, on indeed this relationship between norms and practices uh, based on uh, the, 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 the article uh, of uh, Zainal Bagir and Jim Martian. And I look at it from uh, the cognitive dissonance theory, of course, an old theory uh, in, in social psychology. Uh, 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 and I try to develop uh, and to elaborate on a new way of looking at it from uh, a dialogical self theory. 
uh, cognitive dissonance theory uh, looks at the human being uh, quite in a homogeneous way uh, as, as uh, 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 the human person as a unity. And so conflict between uh, 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 cognition and practice, for example, in smoking, uh, we all know that smoking is bad uh, co cognitively, yet uh, many of us smoke. And then we try to rationalize that maybe smoking is not that bad. And um, my father was also a heavy smoker and uh, he, he became 80 years old and so on. So we try to harmonize our norms and value. Uh, we look at it now from a different perspective, namely uh, not the human person as a homogeneous person, but the human person as a polyphonic or multi-voiced. And I try to show that uh, in uh, the project that I'm going to present. Um, well, happily, um, we just finished uh, writing uh, and publishing a book on the varieties of religion and ecology. It will be uh, presented, launched uh, next week. Uh, nine chapters written by uh, 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 colleagues at uh, UGM in Yogyakarta on the, the connection between religion and ecology. So what I'm going to do, uh, I just presented my, my framework, and so I presented the, the research issue, uh, namely the environmental challenge uh, in Indonesia uh, from the perspective of uh, the social study of uh, religion. And I, uh, uh, I said that the main issue is the inconsistency between norms and practices, and I look at it from the perspective of the cognitive dissonance theory, um, and I elaborate on it from another perspective, namely the dialogical self theory or the perspective of the human being as multi-voiced or polyphonic. So what I'm going to do uh, this morning is I, I present uh, uh, some projects that I'm involved in or was involved in. Um, I'm not sure if I will deal with all the projects uh, listed here. And uh, then I come to my conclusion uh, about the social study of religion and how uh, the social study of religion can contribute to the theory and practice of um, environmentalism. So my first uh, project that I want to talk about is the Chitaram River project. And uh, since you are in Bandung, uh, I think many, many of you uh, know about the problem of the Chitarum River. Um, well, as I said already in my uh, introduction, Chitarum River in West Java is one of the most uh, polluted rivers in the world. I don't know how they reach those rankings, uh, but if you have a list of 10, 10 um, uh, most polluted rivers in the world, I think uh, Chitarum River is at the second or the third place. Uh, it is not so important whether it is to third or second, uh, simply to show that Chitaron is uh, heavily polluted by chemicals, uh, metals, uh, antibiotics, uh, pesticides, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, uh, what we saw is that the, both the national and the provincial governments have had very good visions of integrated uh, river management, the Chitaron roadmap, uh, the integrated uh, Chitaram road map uh, going back to the early 60s, uh, very beautiful plans. Uh, but we also see that those plans were not uh, implemented well and that the, the implementation of the plans were quite fragmented. Um, coming from a country that has uh, water and, and river management as a high priority, for those of you who visited the Netherlands, uh, one third of the Netherlands is below sea level. Uh, so we are good at river management, uh, preventing floods. Uh, so we wanted to share our expertise with uh, colleagues in Indonesia. And we started the Alliance for Water, Health and uh, Development together with my university and other universities in the Netherlands uh, in collaboration with ITB, UNPAD and uh, UNPAR. Uh, at that moment, UI and Bandung was not yet uh, in, in my picture. And we decided to, to uh, train PhD students, eight PhD students in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, way. The PhD students came from the fields of water management, uh, so uh, engineers, uh, medicine, uh, healthcare, international economy, 
development studies, cultural anthropology, and religious studies. And well, we, we, we thought we, we cannot uh, solve this very complex problem, as was also stressed by uh, Professor Lim. Eh? In a fragmented way, we can only solve the problem if, if all the perspectives are taken into account. Um, and so that is what we, what we did. Eh? We, we realized uh, a small university in the Netherlands cannot solve this huge uh, problem. Um, so the only contribution that we, we can uh, give is that we train our PhD students to think in an in interdisciplinary way. And well, Indonesia being the, the largest Muslim population and realizing uh, that the government also tries to involve um, faith-based organizations in solving the, the environmental challenge, uh, we, were, um, yeah, we, we were convinced that we also had to take into account uh, religious studies. So uh, all the PhD students were trained by uh, an, an Indonesian and a Dutch professor coming from two different disciplines. So I supervised an Indonesian uh, PhD student coming from an uh, ag agricultural background. Uh, I come from the field of the, the study of religion. Uh, the the co-supervisor, my, my Indonesian colleague, was a water engineer from uh, ITB. And from both perspectives, we tried to um, train the PhD student, looking at it from the, uh, as I said already, the cognitive dissonance theory. And what we, what we were interested in is that um, how come that uh, Indonesia is uh, one of the, the biggest polluters in the world, uh, second or third polluter in the world, whereas Indonesia is also the largest Muslim community. And purity, purity is the core value in Islam. Uh, purification is the core value in Islam. So how come that on the one hand you have uh, a river heavily polluted, uh, Chitaram River. On the other hand, uh, as a Muslim, you say, uh, I stress, uh, purity, purification, and we see people washing themselves five times per day, eh, ablution water, uh, heavily polluted. How, how come? Uh, can we understand that, that uh, contradiction between the norm, eh, purity, and the fact of polluted water? So for doing this research, uh, we, we had a um, um, comparative case study in a, a rural and an urban uh, site. The, the rural site was Kampung Mahmud. Kampung Mahmud, for some of you, may be uh, well known in uh, Bandung. And the urban uh, site was uh, Chikondewa Kalar. And interestingly, both sites claim that they, they go back to a uh, saint, uh, Eyang Mahmud. And in both sides, there is a grave. That is also an interesting fact that both sides have a grave for this saint. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I cannot go into all the details of the research. It has been published, so uh, you can read it yourself. But we were interested in, in the connection between, on the one hand, the, the pollution of Chitaro River and the, the um, purity as a core value in Islam. And um, well, we were uh, very surprised that that's oh what happens now there is something that i don't like um, we were very surprised that uh, many people say there is no collection there is no co connection between the idea of purity in islam and the pollution of chitaram river um, and so at the conceptual level uh, there was quite some secularization. I, I just quote from my uh, from one of my uh, informants, and I, I'm not going to give all the quotes because that, that will take too, too long, but just one quote. Uh, the religious assembly has no religion with the garbage and the chitarum because they, garbage and chitarum, are concerns of the local government or the rukun warga and the rukun tetanga. The religious council is only concerned with religion. So a huge secularization. And for me, coming from a, a, a secular society, that is quite surprising. And because we normally say that people in the West are secularized. But we found quite some uh, secularization in Indonesia. However, at the daily level, 
at the so at the conceptual level, at the practical level, we saw that people did combine uh, religion or belief and uh, the, their daily concerns and dealing with water management. For example, um, th this is a, a picture taken in Kampung Mahmud. Uh, we see here uh, a well, yeah? uh, well water. Uh, so people don't use the, the water of the Chitano River, so they look for alternatives. So they dig wells, uh, they use applied technology. However, uh, from a, a local understanding and indigenous culture, well water is still water, still water. So uh, according to Islamic jurisprudence, uh, the pure water, ayar sushi, must be running water, must be running water. Uh, well, well water is obviously not running, so it is not pure, according to Islamic uh, uh, jurisprudence. So what they do, uh, uh, they started digging wells, and then they pump the water up through pipes to make it running water. So they harmonize their Islamic understanding of uh, uh, running water is pure water. For doing this, for doing this, uh, they had to ask uh, permission for the saint, huh? according to the local tradition. And for those of you who are familiar with the Sundanese uh, or have a Sundanese background, uh, it was forbidden to... to um, to dig wells yeah, because it is uh, 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 not running water. So they had to ask the permission of the saint, of Eyam Mahmud. Uh, and so they had a ritual. They had a ritual at the grave of uh, Eyam Mahmud to get permission to uh, solve their daily needs yeah, of running water. Um, this is more or less the same. Um, uh, a picture um, according to Islamic uh, uh, jurisprudence um, the, the water can be used if, uh, if there is a container of at least uh, th uh, 384 liters of water so that means uh, 2 meter by 2 meter and 30 centimeter uh, around and then people have the idea oh this is pure water but we know that the water in this basin is heavily polluted but people have the idea, oh no, this is according to, uh, this is according to the Islam, so this is uh, safe. Um, in the urban area, uh, in the urban area, so also many people, uh, many, many people said there is no connection, there is no connection between uh, purity and um, uh, purity and the pollution of the river. Uh, except, except some of the artists, and uh, some of you are familiar with uh, 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 Bandung, they, they know this is uh, Tisna Sarjana, who is very active in, in uh, 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 campaigning uh, to clean the, the river. And, um, well, he uses a kind of a mixture of, of religious uh, uh, ideas coming from indigenous religion, coming from Islam, uh, coming even from uh, uh, Christianity. Here he, uh, we see a picture, a ritual, where he washes the, the feet of his mother uh, and drinking the water. So the water, uh, the water is uh, definitely uh, not pure, but um, he, he wants to show the power of uh, rituals and he performed this ritual before going uh, to the government, uh, uh, the, the provincial government uh, office to campaign for clean water. Here, uh, we see the Kuru ritual in front of the governor's house. Kuru uh, in Sundanese. I don't speak Sundanese, so correct correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Kuru dirt, uh, but they uh, reframed it Kuru uh, Kuru towards the spirit. Uh, here again uh, to show the power of rituals that we really have to do something uh, about it. Um, and so, uh, once again, referring to, to the previous speaker, Professor Lim, uh, I really see quite some uh, activism uh, coming from artists, but also coming from scientists, and so that gives me uh, a little bit hope. Um, now, I see that I, I speak uh, uh, too long, so I will skip, I, I will skip some of my uh, uh, Topics. Um, 
I will just give one other example what we are doing now. <coughs> uh, well, we see here people praying, uh, people praying for water. Uh, we see here uh, applied technology. Um, this is in uh, East Java where people recycle, uh, recycle water, ablution water uh, to be reused. Um, I give one, one other example uh, uh, from the perspective of the inconsistency between uh, norms and practices, and that is the research that I'm uh, involved in uh, now. Um, and that is about the uh, plastic, plastic use in uh, East Java. Uh, and for this, uh, we, we use the, the so-called uh, living labs, uh, living labs uh, approach. Uh, normally green or clean technologies are developed in uh, university laborat laboratories, and then uh, we see that they are not used in the village and because it, is, it goes far beyond the, the people's understanding. So the living labs uh, approach uh, basically uh, has a, a, a different way of looking at it. So what we do, we bring the, the, the engineers from ETS, uh, we bring the, the knowledge centers to a local situation together with the uh, local government, uh, together with uh, the local industry, or local entrepreneurs together with the uh, civil society groups uh, to see what is the issue here in your situation and how can we um, how can we solve this problem here uh, how to implement the concept of a circular economy in the Indonesian land and water resource management at the local and regional scale um, well um, why, why are we doing this uh, research in uh, Pasurua? Uh, because this is a very interesting uh, example of an inconsistency between norms and uh, values. Um, we noted, uh, we, we have a list of about uh, 58 uh, Islamic organizations that produce iron mineral. And some of you may, may be aware of that, uh, uh, some even, even Islamic universities, uh, Uinsa Surabaya has its own brand of uh, uh, Aya Mineral, uh, but there are many uh, Pesantran, and in this list, list seven Pesantran um, produce Aya Mineral, distributing it in plastic bottles. And that is very interesting, uh, because NU committed itself to reduce plastic uh, the uh, plastic waste. Uh, I, I said already in the beginning, uh, the Indonesian go government wants to reduce uh, uh, the use of plastic by 70% in the year 2025, still three years to go. And it asked the um, commitment of uh, Islamic organizations like Muhammadiyah and, and U um, to help uh, and to make people aware that they, they should uh, not use plastic bags uh, and they should reduce use of plastic. Well, I, I'm not going to talk about all the problems related to plastic, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the plastic bags are one of the main causes of floods. Uh, we always think it's about the drainage system. Uh, uh, that is also true, but plastic bags and plastic bo bottles uh, block our drainage system and, is a, and are a major cause for uh, um, floods. Uh, uh, I go back to the first slide. This is uh, Weilang River. Uh, now you are familiar with this. Uh, uh, we, we can see this, this all over Indonesia, uh, full of plastic. The plastic blocks the drainage system and causes uh, floods. Moreover, 70% uh, of the plastic is burned. Now, if you burn uh, plastic, uh, uh, toxic gases, um, um, uh, uh, it produces a toxic, toxic toxic uh, gases, which is a huge health uh, problem and moreover contributes to climate change. Um, now, what we are interested in and uh, the, the, uh, the, the research that we are doing now, and, and basically that is the reason why, why I'm in Indonesia at the moment, is <coughs> how come that on the one hand uh, you have um, um, 
a clear commitment from a faith-based organization and who, eh, uh, talking about it in the national conference, eh, that it should reduce the use of plastic um, because it's, con it's considered macro, eh, according to uh, uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Eh? Uh, so it is not haram, eh? uh, it is not uh, 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 unlawful, but it is macro, it is undesirable, undesirable, that, that is the, the commitment. Uh, uh, but, and on the other hand, uh, you have uh, at, in Pasurwan seven pesantren, seven pesantren that have their own companies to make money, uh, that, that produce a lot of uh, water, hundred thousand of bottles, eh? uh, but distributing the water in plastic bottles, where there, whereas there are alternatives available. Eh? Uh, nowadays, we can uh, distribute uh, water in bioplastic, uh, which is 70% 70, 70 degradable. Uh, it is even possible to, to have uh, wood fiber, uh, which is 100% de uh, degradable in, in three years' time. Um, and why, why are those alternatives not used? So what we are going to do is, first of all, we are going to talk to the KI, eh, how they understand this uh, ruling of NU uh, to, to reduce plastic. So wh why do they say it is macro and not haram? Eh, so what theological reasoning uh, do they have to say, well, you know, it, it, it doesn't harm uh, human beings, uh, but it is undesirable. Well, we know that it does harm. Uh, I mean, the water is full of microplastics. Uh, burning plastic causes uh, tox toxic gases. So it, it is harmful for our health, just as smoking. Uh, smoking is, is harmful for our health. So what is their theological reasoning? Then we are going to talk to the uh, chief executive of officers of the companies that produce the bottle. Uh, Al Yassini, uh, Santri, uh, Sidogiri. Uh, some of you may know Sid Sidogiri is the largest, one of the largest, uh, the oldest, and the richest pesantren in, in East Java. I think it, it uh, started in 1800. It has uh, several companies producing uh, soya, uh, uh, sauce, uh, uh, ketchup, uh, all in plastic. They have their own shops, yeah? their own shops making a lot of money, but everything is packed in plastic. So we are going to talk to the, um, uh, the, the chief executive officers, uh, whether they are aware of this uh, annual ruling and whether they are willing to change. Uh, for example, we know that uh, people buy uh, Al Yassini or Santri water uh, because they think, well, this comes from uh, the Sidugiri Pesantran, so there is a blessing of the Kiai. Huh? This is not only healthy, huh? but also this water is, is, is blessed by, by the Kiai. Well, uh, to make it cost effective, are they willing to pay 100 or, or 200 rupiah more? You say, if I, have a if I go to a shop and I see the aqua, aqua water, yeah, it has this price, but if I buy Al Yassini or Santri or whatever brand coming from Epicentrum, uh, are people willing to, to, to pay 100 or, or 200 rupiah more if they know that this water is distributed in a bottle? That is uh, degradable, 70% uh, or even 100%, um, and has the blessing of the uh, KI. So, well, this, this is the, the, um, uh, the research that, that we are doing now. Eh? I go back to, to where I started. Eh? We are interested in the, the inconsistency between uh, the norms, the values in Islamic thinking and the everyday practice. Um, and this is a very concrete example, huh? a very concrete case studies where we uh, try to discover how um, the norms are um, adjusted to practices to, to, to harmonize um, the, 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 the inconsistency between norm and practice. So why, why is uh, plastic considered macro and not haram? Huh? We, we just try to find the, under, the understanding of that. And are there alternatives and are they willing to uh, find the alternatives? Okay, sorry, um, Professor, to interrupt. I'm you going have to five stop. more minutes long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I spoke about the living labs. Uh, at the moment, we have 10 living labs all, all over Indonesia. 
uh, working on, on various uh, issues, uh, not, not all dealing with um, uh, microplastics, uh, but um, well, maybe in, in relation to, to uh, Professor Lim uh, do, doing a, 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 a living lab is a very concrete way to, uh, to work interdisciplinary yeah, because you bring various disciplines together. <coughs> um, well, I come to my conclusion. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken in uh, uh, Bandung, Agama, Dibangun, Diatas, Kebertsiam. Uh, so the uh, religion is built on purity, but we, we all know that there is a huge uh, uh, gap between the theory and the practice. Now, coming to my uh, conclusion, um, I was asked to speak about the, uh, the, the social study of uh, religion. Um, what I see is that um, uh, many Islamic scholars or religious scholars in general are not used to look at religion as a social construction or a social phenomenon. Because they, they think, well, religion is revealed by God. Uh, so we, we, we cannot question that or we cannot study that in a, in a social scientific uh, way. Um, so the, the understanding of, of religion is quite uh, re, what we call reified, uh, objectified. And that's also one of the reasons why we see quite some uh, secularization, uh, as, as we, we went to, to Bandung. Uh, when I ask the water engineer at, at ITB, uh, well, it is very interesting what you do as a water engineer, but how do you combine that with your, your belief? Uh, because you are an NU member or you are a Muhammadiyah member. And they say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not expert in that. You have to go to the Qiyai or you have to go to the uh, Islamic scholar because I'm not trained in religious studies. And that is an interesting phenomenon. So what we, what we can uh, contribute and uh, what a social study of religion um, can contribute to the theory of uh, environmentalism, theory and practice yeah, from a religious point of view, is to see a religion not only as a revealed reality, uh, but also as a social construction yeah, um, that has a positive or negative uh, impact on environmentalism. Um, and well, what, what, we, uh, what we, 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 we see is that uh, both the, the government and the non-governmental uh, organizations are quite uh, naive. Uh, so the, the government thinks, oh, we can include uh, Muhammadiyah and we, we can include uh, uh, NU to solve this problem. And then NU and Muhammadiyah are very eager to do so. Uh, but what they do, don't see is the huge complexity of religion, uh, the huge complexity of religion. Uh, sometimes religion works in favor of environment, sometimes uh, uh, religion does not work in favor of uh, environment. The huge diversity within religions and the uh, ambivalence of religions. So let me conclude here. My answer to the question, uh, have, what can a social study of religion uh, contribute to the theory and practice of religion is to look at it uh, as at religion as a social construction, a way of looking uh, that is not yet uh, well spread in uh, Indonesia. So let me end here and uh, give the floor back to the uh, moderator.